Today, the committee will address the solitary confinement in federal prisons and immigration detention facilities. Twelve years ago, in 2012, I convened the first ever congressional hearing on solitary confinement. I'm disappointed to report that more than a decade later, the overuse of solitary confinement remains a stain on our nation. I would like to turn to a video that depicts the impact of solitary confinement on those who have experienced it. The diet is horrible, the heat and cold are often unbearable, and normal physical and mental activity, human contact, and access to health care are severely limited. Life in solitary is made all the worse because it's often a hopeless existence. Humans cannot survive without food and water. They can't survive without sleep, but they also cannot survive without hope. Think like you don't have no hope. They, they, you never gonna be out. She spent about 11 months in isolation, sometimes in a cell like this. Documents show officials knew about her history of mental illness, including prior suicide attempts. It's not only me, it's a lot of people who's living segregation time right now. And they need to be out there because at the end of the time, when you get up, you're gonna feel like me. I lived under the rules of a system that's literally, literally driving millions out of their minds. There was a slot that's called a panhole, and that's how you would receive your food. I had to sit on my steel bunk like a trained dog while the officers would place their trays in my slot. This is no different from the way we train our pets. Solitary confinement makes our criminal justice system criminal. One of the men who appeared in that video you just saw was Anthony Graves, a witness at my 2012 hearing. His testimony will stick with me for the rest of my life. Mr. Graves spent 18 years on death row, 16 years in solitary confinement, and then he was exonerated and released. Mr. Graves' testimony gave us a glimpse into the impact of solitary on the human mind. At the time of our hearing, Mr. Graves had been out of prison for two years, but I can remember very vividly that he was not free from the ravages of his time in solitary. Prolonged exposure to solitary confinement can be as profound and permanent as traumatic brain injury and can result in psychological and physical disabilities. And let me remind you, the vast majority of the people who are in solitary confinement will one day be released. Prolonged, pardon me, research by experts and testimony from countless people who spent time in solitary documents how it worsens pre-existing medical and mental health conditions and creates conditions that didn't previous, previously exist. I held a follow-up hearing two years ago after my 2012 hearing. We heard from Damon Thibodeau, whom you saw in the video. Mr. Thibodeau tragically died in 2021 from COVID-19. He spent 15 years in solitary confinement before he was exonerated and released in 2012. He told us, and I quote, I do not condone what those who have killed and committed other serious offenses have done, but I also don't condone what we do to them when we put them in solitary for years on end and treat them as subhuman. We are better than that. As a civilized society, we should be better than that. Mr. Thibodeau was right. We should be better. As the late John McCain, our former colleague and friend, who spent over five years as a prisoner of war in Vietnam, said, and I quote, it's an awful thing, solitary. It crushes your spirit, weakens your resistance more effectively than any form of mistreatment. After my hearings, the Obama administration took some important steps to reduce the use of restricted housing in the federal prison system. Unfortunately, under the Trump administration, that progress stalled, and the rate of individuals in solitary steadily increased. BOP Director Peters told this committee this is one of her priorities. But unfortunately, as I have pointed out numerous times, numbers in solitary in the federal system are higher today than they were two years ago. This is deeply disappointing. We are seeing the same alarming pattern in ICE detention facilities. In the last five years alone, ICE has placed people in solitary confinement over 14,000 times, with an average duration of 27 days. In 2023, of those detained in solitary in ICE facilities, 
an estimated 56% had mental health conditions, up from 35% in 2019. Tragic stories of lengthy detention and solitary of surface. Last month, a man died in an ICE facility in T Tacoma, Washington, after he was held in solitary for almost the entirety of his four years in ICE detention. Individuals who violate our criminal immigration laws must be held accountable, but they should be detained in a humane manner that does not violate fundamental human rights. We in Congress can't just blame it on the executive. We must look in the mirror and acknowledge our obligation to eliminate the abuse of solitary. That's why I reintroduced the Solitary Confinement Reform Act, Reform Act with Senator Coons and the Restricting Solitary Confinement Immigration Detention Act with Senator Schatz. I hope my colleagues will join me in making these bills the laws of the land. I now recognize Senator Graham. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so I think this hearing really should be entitled The Effect on the American People of Catch and Release. You know, I'll be glad to talk with you about solitary confinement uh, and traditional detention and what effect it may have on people, but I imagine it's a tool that most jailers need to protect uh, not only uh, the, 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 the population of prisoners, but probably the individual itself. But in terms of ICE detention, that this that 1% of the people detained, according to the GAO, uh, are put in such conditions. What I want to point out to the American people, there is no detention, effective detention, when it comes to legal immigrants coming to our border. There are about 40,000 bed spaces, and we're talking 3 million encounters. The catch and release program is just one of the greatest pull factors. 80-something percent of the people uh, in an alternative detention program uh, never show up. So really, I think the problem America faces from detention is the lack of it when it comes to people coming across our border. And the price of this policy by the Biden administration is pretty darn high. The Ibarra case, uh, the gentleman accused of killing Ms. Riley in Georgia, apprehended uh, in September 22, released on parole, 23, charged with crime in New York, uh, October 23rd, charged with stealing from Walmart, and now faces charges of killing Ms. Riley. This is one example of a parole catch and release program completely out of control. probably saw the uh, example of a couple of cops being beaten up by uh, a gang of thugs. All of those people, for the most part, were supposed to be in ICE detention in New York, didn't detain them, and they are out on the streets beating up cops, and they run to California. Encounters in FY22, uh, 23, 2.5 million. We're on track now to do over 3 million at the rate we're going. And again, there's 40,000 bed spaces. So, Mr. Chairman, I would suggest we have a hearing about the effect of fentanyl on the country. We're the only committee really of jurisdiction that hasn't had a hearing about fentanyl. I suggest we have a hearing about the catch and release phenomenon that's leading to Americans uh, being killed and injured from policies that are uh, totally out of control. When it came to Mr. Barra, I asked a question. On what basis was he paroled? Under the law, you can only be paroled for two specific reasons. If you have a unique humanitarian need or you have a particular benefit to the country. An individual analysis, we got the report back. Do we have it? The analysis of why he's paroled. Do you have his parole file? I'm going to introduce that in the record, and I, I'd like unanimous consent to introduce the actual document in his case. There's absolutely no indication of why he was paroled. There's no indication anybody did an individual analysis as required by law, just says the guy was paroled. This is a symptom of a greater problem, and Mr. Chairman, I think what we need to be talking about uh, 
more robustly than we are is the effect on the American people of having a catch and release program with no limits. Thank you. Senator Graham, we've had uh, oversight hearings for all of the law enforcement agencies responsible for fentanyl and other crimes uh, committed in this country. And on a bipartisan basis, members have had ample opportunity to ask questions. Fentanyl is a serious, serious problem. A recent uh, briefing last week or the week before with Ann Milgram, the head of the Drug Enforcement Administration, uh, just made that point as clear as could be to me. And I uh, will not resist any efforts to have hearings on fentanyl or any other narcotic threatening our country. When it comes to the issue of immigration and border, what I suggest is the idea of a bipartisan committee. Perhaps we could pick someone like uh, the senator from Oklahoma, Republican senator, uh, to be the spokesman for their side. We'll have Chris Murphy from the, our side and Kirsten Cinema as well. Let them come up with a bipartisan proposal for changing the laws at the border and making sure that we do everything we can to bring order to this situation. I would suggest that in earnest were it not for the fact that we did exactly that. At the suggestion of Senator Graham and other Republicans, we put together this bipartisan committee and asked them to produce reforms for border that relate to the executive branch as well as to our own branch of government. Unfortunately, when we made that suggestion, a presidential candidate named Donald Trump said, stop it. I don't want anything done on this issue before November. And so he said, if, if there are people who want to blame me for this, go ahead and blame me. I blame him. And I blame him for the lack of effort for a bipartisan solution to a problem which requires that. Uh, it's a serious issue. You've raised it many times. Uh, I think we should have used that bipartisan bill as the platform to do something about it. I hope that you'll reconsider your position. Mr. Chairman, I, I promise I don't want to hold the hearing. I'll respond very quickly, if I may, just for a second. Sure. Thank of course. You. Uh, as to the parole problem, on average, the Obama Trump years was about 5,000 per year paroled. Uh, we're talking about 800 to a million people paroled. Um, you don't need a law to fix that. That's a discretionary decision. That's a policy choice by the Biden administration. President Biden hints that he may do something dramatic on the border. Well, the first thing you could do, Mr. President, President Biden, is stop abusing parole. Hopefully, I'll have the file here in a minute, and I can introduce into the record how the man that was paroled that wound up being charged with killing Miss Riley, there's absolutely no analysis under the law as to why he was paroled. Uh, I want the American people to know that this man facing charges was detained by our system, paroled out, and without any analysis as whether or not he deserved parole. That goes on hundreds of thousands of times a year, and you don't need a law to fix that. You need a president to fix it, because he's the one that caused the problem. Thank you. And for the record, President Biden supported the bipartisan bill, which was stopped by Donald Trump and his followers. I hope that you'll reconsider that position. Today, we welcome four witnesses. Our first is Greta Goodwin, the Director of Homeland Security and Justice at the Government Accountability Office, which re recently issued reports on the use of solitary confinement in federal prison and immigration detention. Joined by Nicole Davis, Executive Director of the Talk to Me Foundation, incarcerated for more than 13 years in a federal prison in FCI Danbury in Connecticut. We also welcome Dr. Catherine Peeler, Assistant Professor of Pediatrics at the Harvard Medical School and Medical Expert for Physicians for Human Rights. She worked with Physicians for Human Rights on an exhaustive report about the overuse of solitary confinement in immigration and customs enforcement. Ranking Member Graham, would you like to introduce your witness? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Sheriff uh, Roy uh, Boyd, we're honored to have our witness uh, today. He's the Sheriff of Goliad. Did I get it right, Sheriff? <laughs> County in Texas. He's a seventh generation Texan, has over three decades of experience in law enforcement. He has been a member of the Unified Command for Border Security Operations of Texas since 2008. He started an Operation Lone Star Task Force, which has 30 participating law enforcement agencies local who have come together to fight transnational criminal activity in, across Texas. Thank you, Sheriff. If the witnesses would please stand for to be sworn in, raise your right hand. Do you affirm the testimony you're about to give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I 
Let the record reflect that all four witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Ms. Goodman, you may proceed with your opening statement. Chair Durbin, Ranking Member Graham, and members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss the use of restrictive housing in BOP and ICE facilities. Federal correction and immigration detention facilities can place individuals in restrictive housing in certain circumstances. This type of housing generally consists of one or two person cells that isolate individuals from the general population. Numerous studies have reported that time spent in isolation can cause detrimental health impacts, such as anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and self-harm or suicide. In recent years, BOP and ICE have placed thousands of people in restrictive housing. My statement today will discuss the extent to which BOP has addressed recommendations from prior studies and BOP and ICE manage and oversee their use of restrictive housing. Two studies made 87 recommendations to BOP about its management and use of restrictive housing. In 2014, an independent contractor selected and paid for by BOP issued 34 recommendations. In 2016, the Department of Justice issued 53. The majority of these recommendations have not been fully addressed and some are nearly a decade old. Last year, BOP awarded nearly $8 million to a new contractor to conduct another comprehensive assessment. Earlier this year, we issued eight recommendations to BOP about their restrictive housing practices. BOP and ICE can both benefit from improving their operations. We found that BOP does not have adequate and timely oversight to ensure that prisons correctly identify problems such as staff not following policy. We also found that BOP placed individuals in its special management unit disproportionately by race. Black individuals were 38% of the total federal prison population, yet they represented 59% of the population in this unit. In our interviews with people incarcerated in this unit, we heard similar information. BOP is aware of this disparity, but hasn't evaluated why it's happening. ICE has policies for managing its operations, but information used for oversight is inconsistent. For example, detention facilities provide ICE with supporting documentation that help determine the appropriateness of placements. Yet we found that this documentation was vague and didn't always contain sufficient details explaining why someone was placed in restrictive housing. Also, ICE's data system for tracking placements didn't always identify vulnerable populations, such as individuals with mental illness or others who may require additional attention. Without identifying all known detailed vulnerable non-citizens, ICE is limited in its ability to conduct oversight of their treatment and care. Our prior work has also shown that BOP and ICE were neither routinely nor comprehensively analyzing complaint data, which means they may be missing opportunities to identify potential patterns of noncompliance or areas for improvement. We analyzed summary information for over 1,000 complaints submitted by those in BOP units. These included complaints about staff misconduct, being denied access to rec time, and being denied or provided inadequate amounts of food and hygiene products, such as toilet paper, soap, or sanitary products. We've reported that ICE did not have reasonable assurances that its field offices were investigating or resolving complaints in a timely manner. For example, one unit referring complaints to ICE field offices indicated that for certain non-criminal complaints, they didn't hear back from the field offices 99% of the time. We've made several recommendations to BOP and ICE, and they've agreed with them. Implementing our recommendations is essential to helping both BOP and ICE improve oversight of restrictive housing operations, ensure compliance with relevant policies, and meet their directives to provide safe, well-managed, and humane conditions of confinement. Chair Durbin, Ranking Member Graham, and members of the committee, this concludes my remarks. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much, Ms. Goodwin. Ms. Davis. 
Chairman Durbin, Ranking Members Graham, and members of the committee, good morning. Good morning. It is with profound honor that I testify before you. Thank you, Chairman Durbin, and the members of the committee for holding this hearing on ending the abuse of solitary confinement and for inviting me to testify. Thank you also, Chair McDermott, for repeatedly drawing attention to the torture of solitary confinement. From hearing on solitary and conducting prison visit to question officers about solitary and moving us closer to ending this horrific practice. My name is Nicole Davis, and I am the founder of the Talk To Me Foundation for kids whose parents are incarcerated and the executive director of the Sister of Support House, a safe house for women to keep them from being harmed. It is with profound honor that I stand before you today to shed light on the torture of solitary confinement in federal custody and urge the Senate House of Representatives and the President to pass the End Solitary Confinement Act. My firsthand experience in BOP custody revealed the true horror of solitary confinement. Locked away multiple times during my 13 and a half years of incarceration, I suffered deeply once. I spent nearly a month in solitary when I first arrived at Danbury Correctional Facility because of overcrowding. Another time I endured almost three months because my sister allowed me to hear my daughter's voice on a three-way call after she had been in a terrible accident. Regardless of the reason I was there, each stint left me traumatized anxious, breathless, and deeply depressed. I fear for my safety, witness abuse happening while locked in solitary. I repeatedly heard multiple officers tussling with a woman in her cell while she screamed for them to get, her, get their hands off of her. I would think to myself that if I had to be here, I didn't want to live. I truly felt like I had nothing left to live for. I cried all night until I felt sick. Listening to the women inside the shoe scream and cry out for help every night brought tears to my eyes because I was one of them. I also was scared an officer was going to come in the cell, harm me, even rape me. I made it out of solitary confinement alive. Sadly, many don't survive solitary. Nearly half of all BOP custody death by suicide occur while in solitary. Till this day, I could never shake what happened to the young woman in the cell down for me who was crying out for help. She continued saying she was going to kill herself if they didn't let her out. I called for a staff member or a doctor to come check on her. A doctor came, but they didn't get her the care she needed, and they left her in the shoe. She died by suicide, and the officer came to take her body out of the cell. I am still traumatized by the time in solitary confinement. Even after a decade of freedom, the scar of solitary hunt me. Solitary confinement is not a place to put human beings. I am testifying before you today to urge the Senate, along with the House of Representatives and the President, to enact the End Solitary Confinement Act. This act follow best practice in youth and mental health facility, as well as model program in adult correctional facility to ban solitary in all forms of federal custody beyond four hours, because we know even a short period of time in solitary cause substantial harm and could lead to death or worse in safety for everyone. The act would instead allow alternative forms of separation without isolation and with access to 14 of daily out of cell time involving meaningful human engagement and programming aimed at addressing the reason why a person needs to be separated. These type of alternative forms of separation like CAP and PACE program in New York City jails, the Merlin Cooper program in New York State Prison, and the RSVP program in San Francisco jails have been significantly proven to reduce violence and better support people's health and well-being. For example, the RSVP program include people who had carried out assault, sexual assault, and other violent acts and led to zero violence in jail incident over a one-year period and reduced real arrest for violence in the community by 83%. As someone who has endured a torture of solitary confinement, I know that we need the End Solitary Confinement Act immediately. In closing, I stand before you not as a survivor, not only as a survivor, but as a voice for the countless individuals who have endured and are right now enduring the agony of solitary confinement. I urge the Senate and the House, of, the House and the President to enact the end solitary confinement in order to stop torture, improve safety, and save lives. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Sheriff Boyd. <laughs> Chairman, members of the committee, I'm here today to testify about inmate segregation within the confines of a county jail in the state of Texas. All county jails in Texas are subject to the rules of the Texas Commission on Jail Standards, which oversees and enforces the regulations set forth by processes put in place by the Texas legislature. 
As the sheriff of Goliad County, I am responsible for the operation of a jail authorized to hold no more than 48 inmates at a time. Other counties like Harris or Dallas hold thousands of inmates on any given day. However, regardless of the size of the facility, all county jails in the state of Texas must comply with the exact same regulations. Since this committee is discussing is referred to as solitary confinement, I'll provide you with some of the information about classification of inmates as required by Chapter 271 under Title 37, Part 9 of the Texas Administrative Code. Under this code, each sheriff <clears throat> is to develop and implement an objective classification plan, which must be approved by the Texas Commission on Jail Standards. In Texas, inmates shall be classified and housed in the least restrictive housing of available without jeopardizing staff, inmates, or public, utilizing risk factors, which include the following. Current offense or conviction, offense history, escape history, institutional disciplinary history, prior convictions, alcohol and or drug abuse, and stability factors. Classification criteria cannot include race, ethnicity, or religious preference. Custody levels and special housing needs shall be assessed to include minimum, medium, and maximum custody levels, and the replacement and release of inmates to and from special units, including protective custody, administrative separation, disciplinary separation, and mental and medical health housing, including known pregnant inmates. With regards to segregation of inmates, the following are the rules which jails in the state of Texas must comply with. Female inmates shall not shall be separated by sight and sound from male inmates. Inmates assigned to a detoxification shell shall be transferred to a housing or holding area as soon as they can properly care for themselves. The status of persons confined to a violent cell shall be reassessed and documented at least every 24 hours for continuance of status. Inmates who require protection or those who require separation to protect the safety and security of the facility may be housed in administrative separation. The status of inmates placed in administrative separation shall be reviewed and documented at least every 30 days for continuous status. Inmates housed in administrative separation shall retain access to services and activities unless the continuance of those services and activities would adversely affect the safety and security of the facility. Single cells may be utilized for disciplinary or administrative separation. Inmates in administrative separation shall be provided access to a day room for at least one hour a day. Inmates in disciplinary separation shall be provided a shower every other day. The Goliad County Sheriff's Office is a participating member of the ICE 287G program. However, our facility is not authorized to, uh, authorized to house federal inmates, including ICE detainees. As such, under our agreement with ICE, the Goliad County Jail classifies and houses inmates under the rules and regulations of the Texas Jail Commission standards. Unfortunately, there is mis much misunderstanding and false information about the role of law enforcement and housing of inmates. As the Sheriff and Chief Law Enforcement of the county I, that I serve, it is my responsibility to provide a safe environment for the people who have been ordered to remain in the Goliad County Jail. Once someone is arrested by law enforcement, the Sheriff is responsible for housing that person. I do not have a say about the bond that they receive or the amount. This is done by a magistrate. I do not have a say about whether an inmate remains in jail or is released. This is a decision of the court. These lawful powers remain under separate government authorities to prevent the violation of rights of the persons arrested and placed in jail. As a sheriff and public servant, it is my belief that every person is made in the image of God and shall be treated fairly in accordance with the rules and regulations and laws as provided by the Texas legislature. That concludes my statements, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Sheriff. Dr. Peeler. Chair Durbin, Ranking Member Graham, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm here to testify about the health effects and impacts of solitary confinement. The use and misuse of solitary confinement is widespread in the United States. Solitary confinement causes severe and long-lasting mental and physical health harms, and it can amount to torture. I lead an immigration lab about the immigration detention conditions in the U.S. as they pertain to the health of those detained. My most recent study about solitary confinement in Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, detention was published this past February and informs much of what I will discuss today. No one should be in solitary confinement. 
it helps no one, hurts everyone, and better proven alternatives exist. Solitary confinement syndrome is well known in the medical literature and is characterized by symptoms such as anxiety, panic attacks, difficulty with memory, hallucinations, and paranoia. While many of the acute symptoms may improve once the person is no longer confined, longer lasting medical issues remain, including post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and difficulties with social interaction. The effects in ICE solitary confinement are no different. In our study, we analyzed ICE data about the use of solitary from 2018 to 2023. During that time period, we found that ICE placed people in solitary confinement more than 14,000 times. The UN threshold for torture with respect to solitary confinement is anything greater than 15 days because it is recognized beyond that window that many of those severe symptoms that I just mentioned become less reversible. The average duration of ICE solitary confinement in our study was 27 days, almost two times longer than the UN's threshold for torture. Our review of the data also showed that use of solitary confinement was indiscriminate. One immigrant was placed in solitary for 29 days for, quote, using profanity, and another for 38 days because they refused to get out of bunk during count. The other portion of our study consisted of interviews of 26 individuals who had been in solitary confinement in ICE detention. They described anxiety, depression, paranoia while in solitary, all consistent with the past literature that I just cited in other settings. More than 50% of those who we interviewed required mental health care while in solitary confinement. Unfortunately, only 23%, excuse me, 23% had to wait more than a month to be seen by a mental health care provider, and another 23% were never seen at all. Access to medical care for serious physical health issues was inadequate. Individuals who experienced chest pain and head trauma waited up to a week to be seen by a medical professional. And finally, numerous people reported to us being placed in solitary confinement when needing medical isolation for infectious illnesses. Solitary confinement is not an appropriate way to medically isolate an individual. However, alternatives to solitary confinement do exist. They are more humane, they achieve detention facilities and safety goals, they improve the health of all, including those who work in these settings. For example, the North Dakota Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation undertook a program that resulted in an almost 75% decrease in the use of solitary confinement during a recent four-year study period. By tightening their discretion about who might need solitary confinement and training their staff about how to de-escalate someone who needed separation, they achieved this incredible decrease in solitary confinement Importantly, both incarcerated persons and staff members reported improvements in their health and well-being, enhanced interactions with one another, and less exposure to violence following the program, not more. I want to close with a recent example of th that rings true with what our research found, and you've heard his name already today by Chair Durbin. Charles Leo Daniel was a 61-year-old man from Trinidad and Tobago. He suffered from severe mental illness, and he died just last month at an ICE detention center in Tacoma, Washington, while in solitary confinement. In this most recent stint, he had spent almost four years in solitary. This is not how we should care for those with mental illness. Solitary confinement unquestionably leads to severe detrimental health effects, and what's more, sens sensible alternatives exist. My ask to you are this. Pass legislation eliminating solitary confinement completely and until then drastically limit its use in the United States. Reallocate funding within jails, prisons, and detention systems to proven alternatives to solitary confinement with a focus on un assisting the underlying issue in a humane and productive manner. Thank you for holding this hearing and thank you for shining light on this important issue. Thank you, Dr. Peeler. Each senator will have five minutes to ask questions and I'll start. Uh, Dr. Peeler, I would agree with almost everything you've said, save one particular point. Uh, I visited a maximum detention facility in Illinois, and I asked if I could go into the area of isolation or solitary confinement, and I spoke to five of the inmates. Four of them uh, I could describe, but in the interest of time, I'll focus on one. He was a white male individual who looked to be about 35 years old. I asked him how long he was in. He said, originally 20 years, now 50. I said, how did it go from 20 to 50? He said, I told them that if they put anybody in the cell with me, I'd kill them, and I did. 
they put someone in there and I killed him. I thought to myself, Durbin, get real. This individual cannot share a cell with anyone. I wouldn't want to, no one would want to. So there has to be some alternative for those who need to be isolated for their own sake and the sake of the guards and the other inmates. Having said that, I do believe that the examples that you've given and the ones that I've seen otherwise show the abuse of this practice in the extreme. To think that individuals are in incarcerated and isolated for months, if not years at a time, is unthinkable. Why is it if we have strong reactions against physical cruelty, we don't have any strong reaction against mental cruelty? And this is certainly cruel to even a person who would be described as normal, let alone those suffering from mental illness. Ms. Goodwin, is there any particular recommendation you'd like to point out of the 87 that you've made to the Bureau of Prisons that you think would make a difference? Thank you, Senator Durbin. So of those 87 recommendations, there are about 54 that remain open. Some of them do speak to the need to re-examine whether solitary confinement is the way to go. BOP itself is on record as saying it might not be the best way, particularly in terms of reducing recidivism. So we stand by the recommendations that we made, and we've been paying attention to the, to the, you know, the open recommendations and working closely with BOP to see how they plan to, to meet those. But there are some that speak to looking for alternatives. To, to solitary confinement, looking for some way to, because there are people who do need to be cont contained and confined. And so asking BOP to think through ways that they might um, use alternatives to solitary confinement, alternatives to restrictive housing. Ms. Davis, did you have visitation by counselors or ministers or chaplains or anyone during the period of your uh, isolation? You need to turn the mic on. Thank you for that question, Senator Durbin. No, I did not. No one came back there to check on me. How long were you in solitary? The first, the first time I was in there, I was in there 30 days due to overcrowdedness on the compound. There was no beds. And then and subsequently, were you incarcerated in similar fashion? Yes. How, for how long a period of time? A year and a half. Could you tell me the general nature of the offense that led to your Isolation. Uh, well, I was I was airport I was airlifted to Danbury because that's where I was designated to do my time, and the first time uh, that I came there, I was put in solitary confinement because once again there was no beds available for me uh, to uh, be in, so they put me in segregation housing. What about the subsequent time for a year and a half? Because they said I made a three-way call in, three-way phone call three-way phone call? Yes. That's the time when my daughter was in a terrible accident. And when I called home to speak with my sister, she uh, switched over and made the call to, uh, to the hospital where my daughter was at. So that is considered a three-way call, and it violated uh, BOP uh, rules. Did you ask for any counseling, medical counseling or otherwise? Yes, once I was released out of uh, segregation housing, I went to my counselor, Ms. Bidwell, and she told me I had to fill out um, a call out to speak with a counselor. And when I did that, no one ever answered my call out. Dr. Peeler, you mentioned uh, North Dakota, I believe. It appears that they have done on a statewide basis some reforms that have virtually eliminated solitary. Is that true? The program that I looked at looked um, at several prisons within North Dakota, and they have drastically reduced it by about 25%. I'm not sure if it, it was across the entire state or not, but. In the, in the two main men's prisons, this study did not include the women's prison, solitary confinement has been drastically, drastically reduced. I would just say, uh, before I hand it off here, uh, that this is frustrating for me. I've been involved in this for 12 years. Uh, an article by Dr. Atul Gawande inspired me to get into this issue. I cannot understand how states are showing such leadership in this area and we are failing so badly. I'm going to call on Director Peters clearly to explain why she has not implemented the GAO recommendations and hold her accountable for that. Senator Graham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Davis, what, what prison are we talking about here? Danbury Correctional, FCI. And that's in what state? What did you say? What state? Uh, Danbury, Connecticut. Okay. And 
you were isolated for a year and a half for making a three-way phone call? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sheriff Boyd, tell me about the 287G program. Um, local law enforcement works with the federal government how? Yes, sir. We are a participating member of 287G, and what that is is at the Goliad County Sheriff's Office, this allows us to enter into the federal computer system, identify somebody who is a criminal alien, and then actually go into the system to have a detainer placed upon them. So at the Sheriff's Office, I have uh, one of the deputies, Virginia Escajito, is trained by ICE in order to go in and perform that function. What we do is we identify individuals who are illegal aliens who have already been arrested on criminal charges and are in jail. There is a misunderstanding that that is something we do in the field and we cannot and we do not. It's only for those people who are inmates within the jail that are identified as illegal aliens and are potentially uh, yeah. eligible for an ICE detainer. So what's a sanctuary city or a county? How, how do they differ from what you do? In Goliad, we enforce the laws provided to us by the legislative body in the state of Texas. Basically, what you have in a sanctuary city is, is a governmental body that decides that they do not wish to enforce the laws that have been uh, passed so by the legislative body. So a sanctuary city or county, they'll have somebody detained. They'll find out they're in a legal status. They refuse to cooperate with the federal government to, to get the person detained or issue a detainer. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, you're in Texas. I'm sure you have a lot of encounters. Uh, is illegal immigration a problem for Texas law enforcement? Much like that chart that you put up there a while ago that showed over a 400% increase in, uh, in apprehensions, uh, Goliad County Sheriff's Office, prior to the current presidential administration, arrested on average 77 people a year. Last year, we arrested 482 people. And so our number one charge is, of course, drugs, which is tied to the open border. And then we also have quite a few people that come to jail for uh, smuggling and engaging in organized criminal activity. It has had a tremendous impact uh, on the communities throughout South Texas, including ours. Uh, back to the Ibera case, uh, this, uh, this individual is facing murder charges in Georgia. He was apprehended, paroled in September of 2022 had a law enforcement engagement in New York, and I think in October uh, of that year. So we finally got the file, and it says, I can introduce the entire file if you'd like, but I'll just, this one little sentence here. Parole due to detention capacity at Central Processing, Processing Center in El Paso, Texas. Now that's what his file shows. He wasn't parole because he had a unique benefit to the country or they had a humanitarian need, as the law requires. He was parole because of capacity problems. Um, Ms. Peeler, in one of your reports, I think, you or recommendations you made to ICE, have you made recommendations to ICE? We did. We made recommendations to ICE in our report, Senator. Okay. And one of them said there should require presumption of release from ICE detention for people who have been reported existing vulnerabilities, including but not limited to people with serious medical conditions, mental health conditions, disabilities, LGBTQIA people, and survivors of torture and or sexual violence. So you recommend a presumption that they should be released, that category, but not limited to that category. Senator, I've been asked to talk about the health effects of solitary confinement, and given that the effects are extremely detrimental, particularly for vulnerable populations, and that ICE has directives protecting those populations, it would be an improvement for their health for them to be presumptively released. But, but we released. should, in this category, but not limited to this category, there should be a presumption of release. Not, I believe not, that would include not the health of that population. Not a presumption of you know, not being put in isolation, but just being released. Is that what you're recommending? Yes, sir. Wow. So mental health problems, uh, real quick, Sheriff. How many people involved in the criminal justice system have mental health problems? And if they weren't controlled in some fashion, they would be a harm to themselves or others. Is that a common problem you face? Yes, sir, it is. Uh, I think one of the, one of the problems that we need to look at from both the state and maybe the federal side is 
the fact that we, we generally lack the space for people who are in need of mental health to go to actual mental health facilities. And those people are being shoved in the criminal justice system, uh, which they should not. But on the other side, I will tell you that from a law enforcement perspective, I will tell you that the vast majority of people that I see suffering from mental health, that mental health issue is actually the side effect of the drug abuse that they've, part they've partaken in, uh, which of course goes right back to the open border issue that we have and the drugs that are flowing in at the hands of the Mexican cartels. Thank you. Senator Hirono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to note for the record that when we start talking about uh, undocumented persons committing cr crimes, et cetera, immigrants commit crimes at much lower rates than U.S. citizens. And also, uh, regarding the drug problem, fentanyl coming into our country, most of that, those drugs are coming in the, through the, uh, by U.S. citizens. So, you know, it would be good if we can deal with facts. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for noting that we actually had a bipartisan bill that dealt with uh, the border issues, which uh, former president said kill it, so it was killed. Why we need comprehensive immigration reform. So getting on to the subject of, of um, solitary confinement, Professor Peeler and others, thank you all for testifying. I think it is very clear that the, uh, uh, the effects of solitary confinement continue far beyond the time of the confinement. And I believe, Ms. Peeler, you, you noted a report that you, uh, you did on this issue, and you made two recommendations uh, that I'd like to have you talk a little bit more. One was for DHS to publicly commit to ending solitary confi confinement and issued uh, directives on that commitment. And the second was to require all facilities to report within 24 hours when someone is put into solitary confinement. So is this basically to one, uh, everything that you all have testified regarding solitary confinement, there must be alternatives. And you did note that South Dakota used one of these alternatives. But was it also to point out how uh, extensively solitary confinement is used within DHS? Can you talk a little bit more about these two recommendations you made? Senator, yes, thank you so much. Um, Solitary confinement is certainly widespread in ICE detention. Uh, it is used uh, for disciplinary means, often uh, for very minor infractions, uh, despite stated guidelines for its appropriate use, or use, I should say, as directed by ICE at this time, uh, as well as it's used for administrative segregation, uh, for medical isolation, which I discussed already, which is not how medical isolation looks in the outside world, um, for theoretically for protecting vulnerable populations. Uh, although again, when people ask for protection, they're not generally asking for solitary confinement and for other reasons. And so as a result, because it is so detrimental to health, we have asked that it uh, end entirely in ICE detention. With respect to the timeline, as it uh, stands right now, ICE is supposed to report up within its chain of command when a person with vulnerabilities has been placed in solitary confinement within 72 hours. And 72 hours is a very long time for someone to be in solitary confinement who already has pre-existing vulnerabilities, and not until two weeks for all others. And that is an extremely long period of time. Uh, and so we have asked that the uh, timing of notification be much sooner so that people can be reassessed and ideally taken out of solitary confinement or provided other alternatives as needed. So DHS could... Uh, oh approve or go ahead with these two recommendations, and especially the reporting one, which would indicate to us how frequently solitary confinement is used. What was the reason that they did not uh, take up your recommendation for a quicker time frame for notification? I can't speak to their decisions for why they did or did not do mm -hmm. certain things at this time, uh, but I would certainly hope that they take up our recommendation, because as we've even seen in our own data, the information that we requested via Freedom of Information Acts does not always necessarily align with other data that they have. And so there's many discrepancies, as also noted by Ms. Goodwin in her GAO report. So the more data that we have, the quicker timelines that we understand what's going on, the faster we can help people and improve their health. 
I think that uh, in any situation where there are persons in confinement and there are those who have power over them, that regardless of what kind of criteria, what prohibitions, what limitations we impose, it is very difficult to make sure that that, that is uh, actually happening. So, um, Ms. Goodwin, you noted that uh, you have made, your GAO have made 87 recommendations, 54 of them remain open. Uh, can you indicate that of the 54 which are open, which are the ones that you think are most important for, for implementation? Uh, thank you, Senator. So the 87 recommendations weren't made by GAO. They were made by an independent contractor. Thank you, I, BOP, I stand corrected. And, and, then, um, and then we issued a restrictive housing report earlier this year where we uh, put eight recommendations on the table. And they're about finding alternatives to the use of restrictive housing, making certain that you know, whatever um, BOP does do when they make those, um, when they make those decisions, there is some kind of analysis and evaluation of the effectiveness of them. So my time is running. Is BOP aware of the North Dakota situation or the, that uh, what they did there as uh, testified to by Ms. Peeler? That I'm not, I'm not sure. That, that would be a question for BOP. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Welch? Uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Davis, could, you said you were in solitary for a year and a half for a three-way phone call. Uh, Senator Durbin and Senator, I want to correct that I was in solitary confinement for 87 days for uh, the three-way call, but in the total amount of me being inc incarcerated throughout my time, it was a year and a half. So literally, it was a three-way phone call that yes. involved talking to your daughter who was in the hospital. Yes. Um, you know what? That is like shocking. So it's almost, can you explain it more? It, it's hard to believe it. I mean, that's so shocking. Uh, it happened all the time, Senator. If uh, you make a three-way phone call, they will put you in the shoe for, uh, uh, for um, disciplinary hearing until DHO come to see you. Yes. And once all right, thank you. Can you describe what it was day-to-day -day in solitary? Did you have books? Uh, yes, you can have books in there. You can have magazine. My day-to-day -day was sitting there writing letters uh, to my family to let them know that I was in there. And, and who did you, did you see anybody during the time you were in solitary? Only person that I seen was the officer. And how often was that? Uh, when they come past to give us mail as well as service to food. And did you have any um, ability, were you in a cell where there were adjoining cells and you could even talk uh, loudly enough to have interaction with a fellow uh, inmate? Yes, um, say, uh, the cells are side by side and at one time I did get a roommate where I can talk with her. Uh, but yes, I did have corresponding with the other ladies from screaming from cell to cell. So how did you end up feeling and how did it affect you after 87 days in solitary? I felt like I had nothing to live for because I didn't understand why I would be in the shoe for such a long period of time. I was, I was depressed for a long time. Okay, Dr. Peeler, the, the medical consequences uh, in psychological and emotional consequences of solitary are well known right? And universally, the opinion is it's extremely damaging to the person in solitary. In short order, yes. All right. And uh, aside from the situation that Senator Durbin described, where a person's so violent that you absolutely has to be segregated for the safety of others, um, the, the use of it, as I understand it, is, is oftentimes uh, to control the behavior of a person, right? Yes, and Senator. Often, we found many instances for minor infractions where people were placed in solitary, similar to what Ms. Davis mentioned. Uh, and Sheriff, you mentioned something that I know is true, and that is that uh, the mental health uh, situation, uh, the prisons are the, the last resort. People who have serious mental health issues end up in prison, and they oftentimes have behavior challenges, correct? That's correct. Uh, I firmly believe that if we as a country did a better job of identifying and helping people with their mental health, that many of them would not end up incarcerated because the mentally ill do not need to be in jail. They need no, assistance. I'm in, you know, I'm in agreement with you. I was a public defender. I agree with that. I think you're right. Um, and you don't have the resources, and then it becomes the last resort where people who have a mental health issue, you can't control them. And uh, I don't know if it's out of frustration or safety, but they go in solitary confinement and it gets worse. I mean, the real question I have is whether there should be a ban in effect uh, with very, very severe limitations 
for the Durban situation that we heard about on the use of, of solitary confinement. Uh, and I'll ask you to answer that, Dr. Peters, but it really comes, uh, Sheriff, from my experience being similar to yours, that you're asking the jails in the criminal justice system to deal with mental health. Uh, so Dr. Peters, you wanna to respond to that? Senator, yes. So as it pertains to the health effects of those in solitary, I, I think uh, you know, the reason why the North Dakota program uh, was seemingly so successful is that they, uh, what they did is they sent uh, correctional officers from North Dakota over to Norway to study their program. They came back and were so amazed at how much better the health uh, and safety of uh, people were there that they immediately came back and before they implemented any other reforms, they uh, functionally took everyone out of solitary who was there administratively. That was the first thing they did. And then they really reassessed how they were uh, placing people into solitary confinement who were there for potential behavioral escalations or for safety reasons. Uh, and they implemented um, kind of an improved version of restriction. So people might be separated, but they would be separated for not 22 hours a day, or they would maybe they would be separated. They would be separated the entire time, but they would have more time outside of their actual solitary confinement cell. All of which led to better health uh, outcomes, and all of which generally improves the safety of the system in which they're in. Okay, thank you. I yield back. Thank you all. Thanks, Senator Welch. Before I recognize Senator Tillis, I would like to ask uh, Miss Davis and Miss Goodwin a question. When the director of the Bureau of Prisons was before us in February and I asked her what steps she would take to immediately reduce the use of restricted housing, she stated that almost 40% of the people in restrictive housing have chosen to be there voluntarily and that BOP is actively, actively working to integrate them with the general population. Is that your finding as well, Ms. Goodwin, the GAO? So we're not familiar with that number. What we know is um, there are about seven, at the time of our report, there were about 700 people in protective custody. About 678 of them were there voluntarily. They asked to be for numerous reasons. Maybe they were afraid for their life. Maybe there was a gang, a gang fight or something and they wanted to be uh, put, put, put in protective housing. But what, what's important here, I think, is while someone might have asked for protective custody, I, don't, I can't imagine that they asked to be put in the shoe. And so when we talk about finding alternatives, um, this is one of the things that we are asking um, BOP to pay attention to. This is also part of those 87 recommendations because um, you know, there, there are 11,600 people in restrictive housing in general. Of those, 700 were in protective custody. That's not 40%. Um, and then if you look at just the 700, 600, plus 678 of them asked to be there. They asked for some kind of, to be isolated for, for many reasons. Maybe they were in fr afraid of their lives for, for whatever reason. But we don't think that they asked to be put in the shoe. So Understood. they didn't ask to be isolated in the way that they are. Understood. Ms. Davis, I'm gonna come back to you after the others have had a chance to ask. Uh, in respect to Senator Tillis, who waits patiently time and time again, I recognize you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, I, I am here to ask a brief question, but I, I also wanted to, uh, last week, some of y'all may have described my comments as a rant on the all cops are bastards run. Um, but I wanna thank uh, Senator Butler because she heard what I've been saying for about five different meetings. I just want it off the website. Um, and to her credit, she worked with the people at Act Blue. They've erased a website that was raising money on the concept that all cops are bastards. So I wanted to publicly thank uh, Senator Butler for doing that. that. I don't like coming to this meeting and ranting, but that was something that just got under my skin for about a year, and I'm glad to see that it's been erased from the Internet, best I can tell. Senator, your rants are appreciated. Thank you. Um, now, you know, I... Uh, Years ago, it, it, actually, I, I think I was a rank and file member in the state legislature. I went to visit a close security prison in uh, North Carolina. And uh, it was during a campaign, and we had a gentleman there who I believe was running for lieutenant governor on the other side of the aisle. Uh, we're, we're meeting with Bureau of Prisons. We're in a close uh, security uh, state prison. And uh, we had this gentleman say, you know, I don't think there are any bad people in this prison. There are just good people who have done a bad thing. And I saw the, uh, 
the warden of this particular prison, he sat back, he said, sir, it's very true. There are good people in this prison that did a bad thing, but there are a lot of people in this prison that would kill you if you were in the same room with them. Um, and so I don't think anybody is here saying that we need to eliminate solitary confinement as an alternative, or at least uh, I, I assume not. I'd like to, to confirm that. But we have to get smarter on how we're actually dealing with people, particularly people with profound behavioral health uh, challenges. So, Sheriff, tell me what more do we need to do? I mean, to what extent are these abuses bad people, uh, you know, making a bad decision versus people maybe with not the, the appropriate training or insight into some of these uh, people in the prison population who have to go into solitary confinement? One of the problems that we face all throughout government is ensuring that we hire the proper people that are going to make the uh, make the right decisions and take care of the people. As a sheriff, I feel responsible for the safety and welfare of the inmates that are placed within my custody. Uh, I want them to do as best as they can get out and go on and live a productive life. But as you stated, some people are just not going to do that. I think that if you're looking at it from the federal side, to be quite honest with you, if you want to get the facts and know what to do, then you don't need us sitting up here. What you need is some actual border, actual prison uh, guards from the federal system to come up here and testify about their experiences and why they do the things that they need to do. Because a lot of times they will act and they will do things and it will be looked at from the outside and that view will be completely wrong. Uh, I know that in the state of Texas, even if you do go into separation cells and you're by yourself, you still have the right to things like so much daylight per week, exercise every day. You still have the right to your correspondence. You still have the right to all the things that all the other inmates do, unless you become so much of a danger that it's too difficult for us to take you out of your cell without endangering other individuals. And so I think that from a federal side, if you wish to look at a really good example of how to do things in a most humane fashion, Brandon Wood is the director of the Texas Commission on Jail Standards, and I think that they've done a really great job of balancing that, and if the federal policy would, would mimic something like what the state of Texas has, you would probably find uh, a far less heartburn over how things function if the feds did the same as the state of Texas. Uh, Sheriff, are you familiar with uh, Kalia? Uh, law enforcement certifications? Yes, sir. Uh, when I was the assistant chief at, uh, at the Victoria Police Department, we were Kalia certified. Yeah, are there, uh, I supported that for a small town. We were one of the first towns in North Carolina to have, of our size to actually have our law enforcement officers Kalia certified because they're great on community policing, de-escalation, those sorts of things. And uh, is there equivalent uh, for Bureau of Prisons employees, some sort of certification? I do not know if there is something that, uh, that, goes across on the federal side, uh, so I, I just can't say, okay. Senator. Well, we'll look into it because, you know, again, I, uh, I, I think about the, the same challenge we have in law enforcement. Um, we're not necessarily having people line up uh, to do this tough job in prisons, and uh, I, I don't know. I, I wasn't able to listen to the testimony beforehand, but I still believe, unless somebody can prove me with empirical data otherwise, that Solitary confinement is a necessary part of an escalation with, a, with a, someone who's a ward of the federal government, in this case, uh, who, who uh, represent a danger to themselves or to others. But I also think we, also, always, we should always be pressing the envelope to, to figure out a better, more humane way to do it. But I'm not sure if anyone here has taken the position that it should be eliminated entirely. But it'd be really, you'd be really hard pressed to tell me why I would eliminate this as a tool, because when you do that, it's like what we see in states that decriminalize things. Check with Oregon, it's not working out well. They're re-implementing, we need these tools, because not everybody in those prisons are good people that did a bad thing. May I say something real quick, sir? Yes, sir. So I will tell you that if you, if you completely ban the, the separation of inmates into single cells, then what you will have is you will not be able to recruit prison guards because they will be killed by some of these inmates. No doubt in my mind. Thank you, Sheriff. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Senator Tillis. Senator Ossoff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our, our panelists. Uh, Ms. Goodwin, on the subject of reform, BOP contracted a study in 2014 on solitary confinement and restrictive housing practices. There was a 2016 DOJ report. Between the two of them, 
87 recommendations were made, your GAO report found that the Federal Bureau of Prisons has not implemented 54 of those 87 recommendations. First of all, is it your assessment that that's because of policy decisions that have been made that diverge from the recommendations, or is it uh, a lack of administrative will or capacity to implement them? Thank you, Senator. I think in some cases it's policy decisions that the Bureau makes. Um, in other circumstances, and I think we talk about this in the report, maybe BOP ultimately didn't agree with the recommendations, particularly that the contractor made. Um, but we, you know, when we issued our eight recommendations earlier this year, some of them focused on BOP really needs to address the outstanding 54. And then we added some additional ones that focused on, you know, understanding what their um, administrative remedy program looks like and a number of others. Um, and now they've um, contracted with another um, entity for $8 million to conduct another assessment of their program, and so that'll just be more recommendations that they'll have to contend with. Mm. And, and I asked that question not necessarily because all 87 of these recommendations uh, need to be or should be implemented, but it's a significant number of them that have not been. Has BOP at least put in writing somewhere a substantive explanation, justification, or assessment of each one? An assessment of each one of the remaining. Well, 54? have they have they explained in a substantive way where they've declined to implement or where they've oh, agreed yes. to implement? Why? Yes, and we talk about that in the report because we ask them about all of them, um, and in some cases they might not have felt they were relevant. In some cases, you know, policy decisions change, and in other cases they might have felt it might have been too challenging, too difficult, and in other cases they might just not have agreed with the recommendation. Okay, so of those outstanding 87 recommendations from those two studies and from your own recommendations at GAO, what would you identify as the top two or three priorities that BOP should focus on? Well, we claim, we submit that all of them are priorities. Um, Let's if, prioritize the priorities. Well, well the GAO ones. <laughs> um, but we would ask, you know, part of, the, part of our eight um, speak to their need to address the remaining 54. And so I'd all still, of them, I'd, I'd still like I'm, respectfully to ask you to, 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 to highlight, 50, highlight, a, highlight a couple of the, the most the pressing priorities in your view, please. Okay. Um, well, we talk about, um, from our recommendations, we are asking BOP to develop an extensive approach and detailed outline of how they're going to address the, op the remaining ones. We're also asking them to look across um, all of their facilities and think through where some deficiencies might be. This speaks to one of the reasons why they're on our high risk list, evaluating existing programs, making determinations and decisions about how effective they are, and then finding ways to address and correct them. Evaluation and review are important. Mm -hmm. What's the one policy change that you believe BOP could make today that would have the most significant positive impact? Develop... Um, Probably, probably um, make asking them to make decisions about how they're going to approach all of the open recs, make some decisions about how they're going to, if they decide, well, let me back up. So BOP is on record as saying uh, restrictive housing might not be the best way. And, it's, and there, there are some concerns about what it might have on, the effects it might have on recidivism. So, we're, so the biggest thing BOP needs to do is do kind of an internal analysis of their programs, what's important, what's effective, and the ones that aren't, try to figure out ways to make them better. I think I'm going to have my team follow up with yours on this. And you know, what I'd like to do, and I, recognizing that evaluation, review, assessment on an ongoing basis are important, you know, what, what I'd like for our engagement to, to end is for me to have a sense of the one or two okay. specific policy changes mm -hmm. that GAO deems most substantively necessary in the short term. Let, let's just talk a little bit about protective custody. Mm -hmm. There are, uh, as I understand, about 700 individuals in BOP facilities who are in protective custody. That is, there's a real or perceived threat to that individual's safety. Uh, you identify some potential alternatives. In some cases, however, is use of special housing or isolation or, or, or solitary confinement the only practical solution? Uh, not the only practical. Well, in some cases, yes. Um, 
for the 700 that are in protective custody at the time of our report, 22 were there um, because they had, there was some major violations or there was some concerns about their safety. The other 678 were there voluntarily for fear of whatever might happen to them. The concern here is for those 678, and even for the 22, but for those 678, I don't think that they wanted to be placed in the shoe. When they asked for protective custody, I don't think, and we of course can't confirm this because we didn't talk to, to 678, but I don't think that they wanted to be isolated that way. They just wanted to find a way to be protected. And so part of the, the spirit of the recommendations speak to there's got to be another way than to put people in, in a cell and lock them away if they're asking for protective custody. So BOP, can you figure out what yeah. that could look That's like? That's an important forward? point. I have no doubt that few, if any of them, want to be placed in the shoe, uh, having visited uh, yes. one of these special housing units. It's at not a place I think anyone would, would wish to be placed. Um, I would like, Mr. Chairman, to... Uh, uh, ask unanimous consent to enter into the record this statement, which was submitted by the Council of Prison Locals 33 from Mr. Frank Bailey uh, with their views on the subject matter of the hearing. Without objection. And uh, I want to thank each of the witnesses and you, Mr. Chairman, for convening this. Obviously, some uh, very sub significant human rights and security issues at stake in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Senator Coons is on the way, and I'm going to ask you a question or two in anticipation of his arrival. <clears throat> Ms. Dr. Peeler, in my lifetime, there has been a pretty dramatic change in the attitude of most people toward mental illness and mental health. We went so far as to amend the uh, hospitalization insurance legislation, the a, Obamacare, to cover mental illness, addiction, as well as physical illness. And it was a bipartisan effort. I've seen evidence as well of uh, people who are much more open and conversant about mental challenges. I watched a lot of basketball over the last few months, and I'm sure a number of people have too. I couldn't get over how many colleges were asking young people watching the game to come to their college and suggesting that they offered mental health counseling as part of the services of the university. That's all encouraging from my point of view. It's an indication that things are better. When it comes to mental health and mental issues in incarceration, we draw an interesting line. If I said, well, I want, I want to be sure to contain this prisoner, so I want to be able to beat him with a stick at least once a day, people would say, are you crazy? Physical cruelty like that is unacceptable in a civilized society. You only do it when a matter of self-defense, that sort of thing. But if you say to somebody, I incarcerate you for 80 days in isolation or in shoe, people say, well, sometimes that has to be done. Can you differentiate physical aspects of cruelty with mental aspects? Senator, uh, mental health is part of overall health. So as you uh, just eloquently stated, there's been a real kind of recognition of that in the past many years uh, and decades that you really can't separate the two. One cannot have complete whole health as defined by the WHO without also having optimal mental health. And so whether or not someone is being physically beaten or you know, functionally mentally beaten, it is bad for one's health. And so they are equivalently bad, and they will lead to worse health outcomes overall, as I indicated, both short-term outcomes as well as long-term outcomes uh, for that person. And the reality is, as Dr. Guandi's article reminded me, the majority of these people will one day be released back into society. Ms. Goodman, I think, used the term recidivism. I think you're the first person to say the word at this hearing. But that is part of the conversation as well. Does that experience of isolation mean that the person is likely or less likely uh, to be able to assimilate themselves back into society? Is that not a consideration? Senator, so um, 
You know, I recently went to a talk uh, by another uh, expert on um, prisons and jails and, and health in general, uh, and who has studied this, the Norway system extensively. And one of the system, one of the things that she said that I had not heard, uh, but I thought was really interesting, is that apparently, if you go into Norway, the uh, a person will say to you, if you just kind of ask the general populace um, what they think about the the jail and prison system in Norway, they'll say people go to court for a sentence, they go to prison to become better neighbors. And so I believe that if we continue to harm those who are in our prisons and jails and ICE detention systems, we are making it drastically harder for them to function in society, and it is not surprising that they would then have higher recidivism rates. Ms. Davis, you've lived it. What's your thought on the subject? Can you repeat that again, Senator? I just would like your reaction to this idea of how a person is treated in prison and what it means when they get out of prison as to what their life is like. Um, solitary confinement, Senator, is torture. Any amount of time in solitary, whether it's one day, two days, or an hour, it is is devastating. Upon me being released from prison, I had this uh, shaking when an officer would come up to me because I was placed in a halfway house and I felt that same feeling as I was in the shoe. I was traumatized. Did you have any counseling either in prison or after you were released? Yes, I had counseling after I was released. And did it help, I hope? It did. It did. It did. It had me... Um, it gave me the opportunity to gain a great relationship with my kids because my kids was always wondering, you know, what was going on with me. I would wake up through the middle of the night just sweating, and I would tell them the story of how the prison operated and how I was placed in the shoe. I would just tell them what took place with me, the 13 and a half years of incarceration. And that's why it's so important to me with live experience to end solitary confinement. Thank you for coming today and testifying. I see Senator Coons has arrived. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank you for your forbearance. There is a Foreign Relations Committee business meeting, the first really in months. Uh, Senator Booker is also there and is eager to join this, and we'll try to come in just a few minutes if possible. It's become quite testy, um, but ultimately hopefully productive. Uh, and I'd like to thank all the witnesses for your testimony today. Uh, Ms. Davis in particular, I want to thank you uh, for your personal and powerful testimony about at your experience, it cannot be easy uh, to revisit the trauma that you underwent. Um, your fortitude and your commitment to advocacy is a demonstration of how incarcerated people in our country, uh, those who have endured and survived mistreatment and incarceration, have so much to offer the rest of us as we try to reform our systems. Uh, I also want to specifically thank you, uh, Chair Durbin, for uh, being a great partner um, and, and a real leader in moving the Solitary Confinement Reform Act, it makes clear what we've long known, which is that solitary confinement does little to achieve its stated goals, but can lead to lasting psychological damage uh, that makes us all less safe and increases recidivism. As the co-chair of the Senate Law Enforcement Caucus with uh, Senator Cornyn, I'm, I'm cognizant that properly addressing solitary confinement implicates important questions of officer safety, and I'm committed to working with law enforcement and correction officer organizations in particular on any legislation that we might move forward. Uh, my hope is this hearing helps us begin to find a bipartisan path forward uh, because this really is not and should not be a partisan issue. Uh, in fact, in 2022, um, two quite conservative groups, Right on Crime and the uh, Texas Public Policy uh, Foundation uh, issued a call to reform federal solitary confinement. And many of my colleagues uh, on the other side of the aisle helped address juvenile solitary confinement as part of the First Step Act. Uh, but the harms of this practice are hardly confined to youth, as you have testified, Ms. Davis. Um, so there are things we agree on here. Uh, I hope that we will find uh, the will and the strength to re-engage uh, in criminal justice reform that can impact um, so many uh, adults who are incarcerated uh, and whose treatment while incarcerated um, causes real harm. Ms. Davis, uh, you've testified that uh, solitary confinement doesn't just cause devastating harm, can, can lead to death. It also makes it more likely um, someone will harm someone else. 
Um, that's consistent with the studies cited by the Right on Crime paper, um, that recidivism is higher among people with the same risk profile who are subjected to solitary confinement. Can you just say more, help me understand why this would be? Thank you, Senator. I think that um, in the solitary confinement, um, it, I think that we need to come up with some type of alternative um, program instead of a solitary confinement, so therefore the uh, incarcerated people can get the help that they need, because it only just continues to inflict harm when you place one in solitary confinement. It's not helping them, it's only harming them. It's torture. It's literally, it's torture being inside solitary confinement, no matter how many days it is. Ms. Goodwin, um, one of the right on crime paper's key recommendations is the need for greater transparency, for data about the Bureau of Prisons practices. But what did your report find about BOP's publicly available data uh, and how could improving transparency help ensure better compliance with best practices? Thank you, Senator. So one of the things that we found just in terms of BOP um, wasn't routinely analyzing the data that they had, uh, whether or comprehensively looking at it. And being a little more transparent helps everyone. Um, it helps um, the officers in terms of better understanding what the policies are so that they don't find themselves out of compliance. Um, if you're a person who's incarcerated, you have a better understanding what the policies are, what might or might not put you in restrictive housing. Um, so there's some of the things that, that we've been looking at. And reforming solitary confinement, uh, it's challenging, it's important work. Mm -hmm. Uh, I recognize it can place um, some additional burdens on uh, law enforcement officers. From your review, Ms. Godwin, what are the biggest challenges that staff and officers might face in making and implementing reforms? Uh, and how uh, could Congress or BOP or other agencies actually assist in a reform process? Well, in terms of the reform, I mean, you know, we've got the First Step Act. Mm -hmm. um, BOP, I, our understanding is that the director of BOP is committed to making changes. Uh, to the use of restrictive housing. So waiting to see what those new policy might look like. Um, I, um, and then of course, we will always be there to review and, and, um, do, an, um, and do a report to look to see how well they're applying um, and adhering to whatever policies there are. Um, the director, as we know, has said that um, the use of restrictive housing or restrictive housing in general might not be the best way um, and so we know that she and her staff are looking to see what alternatives might look like. And so if there are going to be alternatives, we want to make certain that before they move in that direction, whatever they're wanting to do, there's some evaluation of it. There's some um, um, input from the people who are, who are going to have to, you know, implement it. Well, let me conclude, Mr. Chairman, uh, again by thanking you and by just reflecting, Ms. Davis, that um, what you experienced and what you testified to is also what study has proven, which is that when misused, when overapplied, um, solitary confinement is torture, and it imposes horrifying impacts on the individual that doesn't produce positive benefits for society. It is a lose-lose all across the board. So in the interests of our values and in public safety, let's continue our bipartisan criminal justice reform journey and do more to reform solitary confinement. Thank you for your testimony today. Thanks, Thank Senator you, Coons. Before I recognize the next senator, I would like to uh, say for the record what I've said other times. I really believe it's valuable for every member of Congress, the House and the Senate, as we spend so much time discussing incarceration and penalties and crime, that you at least take advantage once every two years to visit a correctional institution and see with your own eyes what's going on. It's an eye opener. It has been for me and I continue to go that direction. I'd like to include Norway on the next visit. Uh, it would certainly be worth, worth our while. Under the early arrival rule, uh, Senator Blackburn, you're recognized next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. And you know, many of us do visit prisons. And one of the things that repeatedly comes up is the number of repeat offenders and how difficult soft on crime policies have made it on our local law enforcement agencies in the judicial system and also the effect of fentanyl 
on communities. When you look at those that are incarcerated, the number that are there because of drugs and mental health issues, those are issues we should be doing a deeper dive on. And uh, Chairman, uh, Senator Graham mentioned what, how he was surprised we were taking our time today to talk about solitary confinement when we should be talking about HR2, a border security bill. Number one issue with the American people right now is what is happening with that open border. Every town's a border town. Every state is a border state because of the effects of the Biden open border policy. It is all intentional. It is what they wanted. And it's what our colleagues across the aisle continue to support fentanyl racing into this country. We should be looking at that, Mr. Chairman. None of us want that in our communities. Look at the number of children that are being exploited by cartels that are trafficking children and they're being trafficked into labor gangs. They're being sexually exploited. These are things that are happening and I wish that we were putting our time into that. Now back when I was in the House in 2007, I introduced a bill, the CLEAR Act, and it would take some of those provisions from the 287G program and give authority to local law enforcement. When they apprehend somebody that is in the country illegally, they can hold them. And then ICE has to come and ICE has to deport them and then reimburse that local law enforcement agency for what they have spent. So Sheriff, I wanna to come to you and thank you to each of you for being here today. I appreciate it. I, I would like to get your thoughts on legislation like the CLEAR Act that would empower local law enforcement and then have ICE deport these criminal illegal aliens and reimburse local law enforcement for what they have spent and deny federal law enforcement funds to jurisdictions that, that will not comply with federal immigration law. Senator, what you're talking about is not something new or revolutionary. Uh, we had that at one time. If I remember right, it was somewhere 287G. around. 287G. Well, even, bef even before then, yeah. uh, even before 287G, in the 1980s and 1990s, we had officers at the Victoria Police Department who were dual commissioned as U.S. Customs agents and local police officers. And they, they had the authorities that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And so the restitution of those authorities is something that can be looked at by federal authorities. And so I think that we all have to work together and do our part because this open border that we're facing right now and the, the surge of transnational criminal activity uh, is overwhelming us. I heard one of the senators early say that most of the fentanyl is being brought in by United States citizens, and that is not correct. If you lived on the, down on the border like I am, then what you'll find is that is being brought here by transnational criminal organizations. Some of the people that work for cartels do live in the United States, but that product is being shipped here by cartel, uh, cartel members from Mexico into the United States. They no longer are dependent on China for the precursors to make fentanyl. They have now figured out how to make it themselves. Those individuals in Mexico are some of the smartest people you'll ever meet, and they will figure out exactly what to do in order to generate a profit. And I think that we need to look at the ability to deny transnational criminal uh, activity and organizations any ability to make profit within the United States. Because I don't know if any of you have ever sat down with a Sicario before. I have on multiple occasions. When you talk about solitary confinement as it's being called here, we call it separation in the state of Texas. Those people have to remain in separation or they will kill somebody. It's not like the movie. They're not professionals. They're sloppy and they're mean. And we have to deal with them in a manner that protects not only our correction officers, but also the fellow inmates that are in the facility because it doesn't matter if you're a jailer or an inmate, you're made in the image of God and I have to protect you no matter what. 
Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. And Senator, uh, we, in previous stage of the hearing, we had a similar request uh, that we deal with uh, legislation that addresses border issues. And I, I, for one, would like to remember that it was Senator Lankford's effort that resulted in a bipartisan bill, which many of us actively supported. Mr. Uh, Chairman, um, as we know, that was not a border security bill. It was an immigration bill, and H.R. 2, which is a border security bill, landed in this committee last May. Last May, the first part of May. Let me just say, say, Senator. We should have a hearing on that, whether we like it or not. Senator. Let's take it up and let's debate it and look at what has transpired at this border. I talk to parents every single week who have had a child Im, uh, impacted by, by fentanyl and people that are seeing some of these labor gangs. I am terribly concerned about these 85,000 children that HHS and DHS can't find. Well, we can go into all of these issues, and we have in the past, but I will tell you that the bipartisan effort by Senator Langford, the chosen representative of the Senate Republicans, along with Senator Murphy and Senator Sinema, was the first bipartisan effort that moved us towards 60 votes, which is essential for passage in the Senate. And it couldn't get it where got it four needed Repu to go. Four Republicans, after they told us point It was point not by, a border security uh, well, bill. Well, I tell you, you're wrong. And I want, well, wrong, no, sir, Senator. I am not wrong And HR2 received no Democratic bill. votes. I don't, I don't want to go down these rabbit holes of the American partisan. people are expecting us to do it. That's why they want a trial well, on well, Mayorkas. And I think it is so wrong that Chuck me, Schumer is trying to table you're, I can't this. keep up with all the issues you're throwing at me, Senator. We came today to talk about solitary confinement in federal prisons. And I hope we can get back to that subject. At this point, Senator Kennedy is recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here. I'm sorry I was late. I was in another another committee. Um, I want to ask each of you this question, and if you would be mindful of the fact that I only have five minutes, so if you could each maybe give me a, a one-minute answer. Um, if a bill were before, and I want to talk about prisons, federal prisons in general, if a bill were before the Senate to abolish solitary confinement in federal prisons. Um, what exceptions, if any, would you recommend that we include in that bill? Let's, can we start down here? Senator GAO would not make any recommendations until we've had an opportunity to review the bill. No rec, okay, yes ma'am. Um, thank you, Senator. At this time, I don't have an answer for you. Okay. Sir? I would recommend that you follow what the Texas Commission on Jail Standards has done and follow the lead of Brandon Wood and the outstanding leadership and that what, the state of Texas What exceptions did they recommend? There are some exceptions within there for minor infractions. There, there is a list of things that you cannot put people in solitary confinement for. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have a comprehensive list of it right now, but I'd be more than happy to obtain that for you. So we have over 600 points of compliance at local jails in the state of Texas that we, we must keep up. And so we work to ensure that we comply with all of those. And separation cells are one of the many things that we deal with. So. But I think if the federal government wishes to look at what the state of Texas has done, I think it would be beneficial if there is a problem. Doctor? Senator, I am here to talk about the health effects more so than the exceptions. But I would say that I would recommend looking to the alternatives to solitary confinement that already exist in multiple cities and states and potentially understand what exceptions they use to help inform uh, your policy changes. I must have asked a dumb question because 
I didn't get a I didn't get any answers. Let me try it another way. Um, are there any instances in the real world that we live in that in your judgment, solitary confinement is appropriate? Doctor, we'll start with you this time. Senator, your question builds off of uh, what Chair Durbin had actually um, said earlier about uh, who, who might need solitary confinement. I think for me as a health professional, what I find problematic is the current definition and use of solitary confinement of 22 uh, doctor, hours a day. Doctor, I appreciate that, but... I don't can, think that there can are. Can you answer my question? Yes, yes, sir. I don't think that there are uses of solitary confinement in its current iteration of 22 hours a day for anyone. Okay. I think that certain people Th need to be separated. Thank you for being straightforward. Yes, you're welcome. Um, I appreciate finally getting an answer. Um, it's sheriff, right? Yes, sir. Sheriff, are there any circumstances uh, in your experience when solitary confinement is appropriate? Yes, sir. I'll give you a list of some of the ones that are listed in the uh, Texas Jail Commission. Interfering with a head count, mm -hmm. in, uh, uh, which we are required to do twice a day. Attempted escape. So, so if someone interferes with a head count, that they should be in solitary confinement? They should yes, be? yes, okay. that's something what, that what they else? can. I interrupted you. I just want to be sure I understand. What else? Yes. So attempted escape, possession of weapon, attacking jailers or inmates, destroying security equipment within the facility. Those are all ones that are listed in the, uh, in the code for the state of Texas. Okay, are there any other? Sometimes we use uh, separation cells in order, to, in order to separate gang members mm -hmm. during times of, uh, of unrest. Uh, sometimes we utilize separation cells when somebody comes in initially in order to prevent them from talking with or intimidating other witnesses. What do you witnesses. mean by separation cells? It's a single, a single person cell. So we will put them in a single person cell so that they cannot intimidate any of the, any of the co-conspirators in a case. And I'll give you a good example being down on the border. Sometimes can, we'll can arrest... Can I ask you this? Sorry to interrupt. No, I'm go ahead. run out of time. I apologize, Sheriff. If a person's put in a single... In a separation cell, is that considered solitary confinement? There is no such term in the state of Texas. It's separation cell, sir. Okay. So I guess based off of the definition that's been used here, I guess you would call it that. But we call it separation cell under well, our law. Well, if the prisoner is put in a separation cell, does he have any contact during the day with other prisoners? Yeah, they'll have, vo they'll have vocal contact, yes, sir. They'll have what? The, they'll have vocal contact. In a jail setting, you're not going to have somebody that's isolated by sound. They also have access to publications. They also get access to phone calls, uh, any of the correspondence that comes via the mail. They get exposure to sunlight, and they, get, uh, they also get exercise every day. Can I ask the other two witnesses the same question? Ladies? Are there any circumstances where you think solitary confinement is appropriate or, or necessary? Uh, Senator, I just think that with live experience, I think that no human being should be placed in solitary confinement. Okay. And Senator, as you know, GAO, these are policy decisions and we evaluate any program with policies or practices, but we don't opine on policy decisions. So what if, you, if it's something that you all uh, put forward as policy, we're happy to review it. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry I went over. Thank you. Well, thank, you thank you for attending the hearing, Senator, and uh, your questions. And i just say during the course of the hearing, we have used many terms interchangeably, and they are different, uh, much different. Uh, protective custody. You are separated, as the sheriff has mentioned, sometimes by your own choosing. I think what, what is different is most people in the corrections and incarceration <clears throat> don't want to use the term solitary confinement. It has an odious con connotation to it, and so they use different terms, separation, administrative uh, separation, and the like. 
uh, I think how you're treated when you're in that cell is different under different circumstances. Uh, Miss Davis described her situation to us earlier, and it was the classic solitary confinement with one hour or two hours out of your cell and no physical contact to speak of uh, while she was incarcerated. That is what I imagine it to be, no matter what the title may be. Senator Booker. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I can't tell you how grateful I am for this hearing. To me, what's going on in the United States of America is astonishing to me. I think Mr. Boyd is correct. There are legitimate reasons for the safety of incarcerated people uh, to use isolation. It, it, is, it is fundamentally understandable. But what is stunning to me is how widespread putting people in a space the size of a parking space for days and days upon end is a practice that is so Byzantine, so universally condemned by other peer nations, so torturous to individuals. It is stunning to me when I talk to correctional officers, when I talk to inmates, when I talk to families, it is stunning to me that this practice goes on still in our nation at such a widespread level. There is no excuse whatsoever for torturing individuals. And often, this is a case that is accelerated by us because we are underfunding institutions that could help add to the safety of our correctional officers, safety of inmates, that often solitary is relied on as a practice that is so extremely harmful to human beings and especially so to children. Ms. Peeler, you in your report call it torture. And, and let's explore that for a second. Is this some kind of left-wing idea that putting people in these spaces is torturous, or is there scientific data, study after study after study, that shows the harm of solitary, under whatever name it's called or euphemism is used? Senator, the, the torture definition comes from the United Nations, uh, and the reason why the UN Special Rapporteur picked uh, the time of 15 days is because there is a mountain of scientific evidence that shows that after that period of time in solitary confinement, many of the acute symptoms can become reverse, irreversible. So, so again, mountains of scientific evidence. This is not up for debate that it could cause permanent harm to individuals. But what about brains that haven't developed to the point of 25 years old? What about youth brains or, or adolescent brains? What does it do to that, to children? So, Senator, I haven't, I, although I take care of children in the ICU very frequently, I haven't studied solitary confinement specifically, but I will tell you as a pediatrician, the pediatric brain is in constant flux, and it takes a lot of its information from its environment. 19, so, 20, 21-year-olds? 19, 20, 21-year-olds are still children. They still are developing their frontal lobe, and so if their experience is one of torture... Does, does it make people, if I'm concerned about the safety of my correctional officers, do people who are in solitary confinement for a month or two months, do they come out less dangerous to themselves and others or more dangerous to themselves and others? they come out more dangerous. There. Significantly more dangerous. This has been studied and we know it to be the truth. What happens to suicide rates? Suicide rates are quite high for those who have been in solitary confinement. Uh, almost 50% of suicides, I believe, in the uh, BOP can uh, actually occur in solitary confinement. And Mr. Daniel, who died uh, recently in ICE detention, uh, a recent study following up of him showed that there actually have been six or seven uh, suicide attempts in that same facility in the last few months. I ended up losing my mind for two weeks, even talking to myself. I thought about suicide. I still have those thoughts now in Senegal. Anytime I hear a door, my heart would start beating faster, like I was having panic and attack. I still don't feel like being in confined spaces. These are people years after being out of solitary confinement. The post-traumatic stress stays with them. 
And we know that people who are suffering from PTSD are a danger to themselves and can be, under some circumstances, a danger to others. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And, and so, um, Ms. Goodwin, the, the funding problems we have when it comes to uh, correctional facilities throughout the United States or, or, or correctional facilities specifically for immigration, is this an issue leading towards the usage or overusage of solitary confinement? So when you're thinking about uh, the Bureau of Prisons, I'll yes. start there and I'll talk about ICE. When you're thinking about the Bureau of Prisons and GAO, we've issued a number of reports um, talking about challenges with BOP staffing and what that could look like. Um, and of course, it affects all of the operations. And one of them, of course, would be the use of restrictive housing. Uh, when you think about ICE facilities, there is a concern about um, the facilities finding enough locations and the appropriate amount of bed space for individuals. So both of them are a concern. Staffing is a major issue um, and the ability to find locations that would partner with ICE to, to hold or to, to, to ensure that there are spaces for people to be detained is another challenge. Right, and so Mr. Mr. Chairman, who are we? We're the United States of America. And we so savagely underfund our prisons, just in the last budgetary round, we cut funding to our prisons even more. Endangering correctional officers, undermining their sworn duty, undermining legislation that we have passed through this body that helps to lower recidivism rates and keep people safer. Our First Step Act, bipartisan, we have undercut it by underfunding the Bureau of Prisons. But what should keep all of us up at night is the fact that every single day there are practices going on in our prisons that our correctional officers don't agree with that fundamentally amount to the kind of torture that we condemn other nations for doing. This is sick, this is unacceptable, and it's un-American that this practice goes on widespread and there are tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people who are being permanently affected and their families are being impacted and our public safety is being undermined. This is outrageous that we talk about this as an ongoing problem in our country and don't do the common sense things that should get bipartisan support to stop these practices, to support our correctional officers, to keep them safe, to keep our prisons not to be the reflections of the darkest corners of our society, but our prisons should be places that reflect our highest virtues, like redemption, like second chance, like rehabilitation, like public safety. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Booker. I'm fortunate to be chair of this committee. I'm honored with that opportunity. But there are sources of frustration, and this is one of them. This is an issue which came to my attention just by random reading and that article by Dr. Atul Gawande, which I recommend to all of you, the impact of isolation on the human mind. And I started this trek 12 years ago, 12 years ago, through three different administrations now. And I have to say there's no appreciable progress that's been made. In fact, we've gone backwards in many respects. And I, I wonder if it is just a basic economic issue, which Senator Booker has raised, not enough people to do the job, and therefore some alternatives that are not preferable are turned to because they're easier to do, whether it reflects an attitude toward incarceration of the people who are incarcerated, which we look the other way too often, whether it's racism, and that point has been raised early on in the course of this hearing. But through various leaders at the Bureau of Prisons, of both political parties, They've given me lip service about doing something, but neither, neither one that I've worked with has really changed the situation. There's a frustration involved in it. In, in a democracy, you've got to accept that as part of the challenge. But I do believe that this is a special case. I believe when it comes to corrections and incarceration, we don't put a priority on it. These are people that we've walked away from, and we assume that we'll never face them again, and the honest answer is yes, you will. You'll see them again. At some point in your life, America will see them. And in the process, are we making their lives better? Ms. Davis, you're amazing. Story you tell, 
13, 14 years in prison and coming before us today. I really thank you for that. That took courage to come up here and tell your story, and you did it. I appreciate that so very much. Sheriff Boyd, I was just sure that I wouldn't like you at all, but I do. I can't <laughs> explain it. You know, I, I really respect you. You're now my favorite Texas sheriff. <laughs> I don't have a long list, but you're at the top of it. Thank you so much for being here today. Dr. Peeler, thank you for your perspective. Being an pe active pediatrician in addition to having your interest in this topic really is impressing me. And Ms. Goodwin, you had a tough job today representing the GAO, walking that tightrope, not making a policy endorsement, but trying to be very honest and forthcoming with us. It's been a great panel. I see some friends from organized labor here representing correctional officers. You're usually sitting at the table. Next time you will be. I'm sorry we didn't have enough slots today to bring you into the effort. You may receive some written questions. If you do, I hope you'll respond to them in a timely fashion. With that, the committee stands adjourned.